I am so delighted to introduce your next speaker tonight. He and I have been friends for about half our life, and it has been a joy to be a Christian brother and co-laborer in the Lord's Vineyards with Dr. John Payne. John and I went to the same college together, and we often find our experiences there and the joys we have uh, from that place. Uh, it's often a conversation uh, that we share with one another. Uh, I mention that to you because John and I are both Clemson men. I know that there are a lot of Alabama men in the hall today. Uh, I would just remind you to have an interest in Clemson because it's where your next football coach will come from. <laughs> Joe Sherman was a famous Clemson graduate of the class of 1935, and he wrote a little poem about Clemson that I want to share with you tonight as I introduce my brother John. My thoughts often wander through those upper South Carolina hills. Now let me just stop right there and say, in biblical terms, that's the tablelands of South Carolina that shelter the university that forms a common bond for many thousands of people who have studied, taught, or worked there. Next to my church and my home, I love Clemson University beyond all other institutions this side of heaven. I know there is something in these hills. Well, uh, similarly, uh, next to my church and my home and my family, I've come to love and appreciate uh, the ministry, the friendship, and the brotherhood of John Payne. So grateful for the way in which he leads the Gospel Reformation Network. I'm so grateful for his ministry of writing. I'm so grateful for his leadership within the PCA. John, would you come and speak to us tonight? Join me in welcoming Dr. Payne. Beloved, if you'd open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and beginning in verse 17 of an appropriate text for a gathering like this of teaching and ruling elders as we consider the ministry to our people. And as I, before I begin reading, I do want to bring uh, greetings uh, to all of those who are live streaming in, uh, not least my own uh, precious congregation, uh, Christ Church Presbyterian in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, what a joy it is to be here uh, with you tonight. Look with me at Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you, none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things 
to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all, because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. Here ends the reading of God's word. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for this word of life, a supernatural word which is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing down to the very marrow of our souls. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you work in us that which is pleasing to you and conforming us more and more to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that we would find ourselves this evening repenting of our sins and putting our hope and our faith in Jesus Christ and being willing and ready followers of your word. Lord, where our ministries are deficient, would you strengthen them? Where they are strong, Lord, would you humble us and remind us that we are utterly and completely reliant upon you? And may you receive all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beloved, growing up in Northern California, I attended countless uh, college and pro sporting events in the San Francisco Bay Area with my dad. These are some of my favorite memories as a kid. We would go see the 49ers, uh, the Giants, the A's, the Earthquakes, uh, the Stanford Cardinal and many international soccer friendlies between world soccer powers such as Napoli and Flamengo and Arsenal. Why so many games? Why so many teams? Well, it wasn't simply that we loved sports. My dad was a professional sports writer. It was his job to cover Bay Area sports for the San Jose Mercury News. What was great then about going to work with my dad was not just sitting up in the cheap seats and seeing things from the stands, but getting an up close and personal look and time with the players and coaches. Indeed, I have vivid memories as a child watching and meeting players like Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and Kenny Stabler and Fred Bolitnikoff and, and so many other of uh, the great uh, players of the 70s and 80s. I would see them at training camps and uh, after big games and sit with my dad as he conducted interviews in locker rooms. As with anything, I think that security was a lot less in those days and kids could tag along with their dads to places like that. I remember on numerous occasions being with my dad as he dialogued with legendary coach John Madden. But it wasn't just football, it was surreal to meet Michael Jordan in his final year at UNC while they were playing a game at Stanford. And and to, and to meet and even sometimes kick the ball around with international soccer legends like George Best and Franz Beckenbauer. As a young soccer player, it was amazing to watch these world-class soccer players uh, up close, uh, to see the way they would handle the ball which, with such skill and finesse. I was in awe. Being that close to athle athletic greatness did something to me. It did something to me. It fueled passion for the game. It fueled ambition to excel in the game. And my game improved in part by imitating their game. Being near these players was inspiring. It was instructive. It gave me aims and goals as I watched these parag paragons of the game play soccer. Well, it's 40 years later. I'm not playing much soccer anymore. 
and I can hardly get through a soccer match at the church picnic without pulling a muscle, uh, which I did two weeks ago, actually. But as a called and ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and an unworthy steward of the mysteries of salvation, I still need examples. I need models, not of athletic greatness, but of ministerial faithfulness. Dear fellow pastors and ruling elders, please hear this. An important part of our sanctification is through godly imitation. An important part of our sanctification is through godly imitation. This is not simply having heroes that we admire, but godly men and women that we seek to model ourselves after. Now, our imitation is first and foremost through the spirit-empowered imitation of our elder brother, our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just a savior to be trusted for the full payment of our redemption. He's a, a model of godliness to be emulated. We are called to be conformed to the holy example and perfect image of the second Adam, our crucified and risen savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are also called to, to imitate models uh, from church history. Dear ones, there may be disagreements in the PCA, but I don't think this is one of them. We need godly models for faithful ministry. Perhaps it's one of the problems that we have in our own denomination is when pastors and elders are no longer looking to others uh, as models of godliness, particularly from church history. As spiritual under-shepherds in Christ's church, we learn and grow in part by imitating imperfect but biblically faithful examples from the past. Those who constitute that great cloud of witnesses that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11 and are exhorted to follow in Hebrews chapter 12. Many have joined that great cloud of witnesses since that time. Many of us will have read, for example, the marvelous biographies published by the Banner of Truth Trust and Reformation Heritage books and, and Christian Focus and others, uh, devotional biographies on faithful pastor theologians and courageous missionaries such as Robert Murray McShane and J.C. Ryle and Lloyd-Jones and John G. Uh, Payton and several others. As a young minister, I was exhorted to, to always be reading a biography, to always supplement my devotional life with biography because biography does something to you as we reflect upon the life of someone who has gone before. It's been deeply formative uh, to me and not least in reminding me that current trends in ministry aren't always good ones. And that the mission and message, message of the church mustn't be reinvented every six months in response to cultural movements and socio-political change. But dear ones, does it even need to be said that there is no better place to find faithful of examples of ministry than in God's word? And right here in Acts 20, we find a sublime model of pastoral faithfulness in the Apostle Paul. And dear ones, as we come to this text this evening, we are not left in the cheap seats. We are not looking from a distance, unsure about what's happening down below. Now here in Acts 20, we get an up close and personal look at the Apostle Paul. We see his boldness, we see his humility, we see his passion, we see him unwavering in ministry. It's a method and manner of ministry that we should all seek to emulate. And please hear this, Paul's priorities must be our priorities if we are going to establish, cultivate, and maintain healthy biblical churches in the PCA. You read that again. Paul's priorities must be our priorities if we are going to establish, cultivate, and maintain healthy biblical churches in the PCA. Why? Because Paul's priorities are the priorities of Christ. He is fulfilling the Great Commission, the commission which Christ gave him. In fact, as we look at the apostolic ministry, we see them carrying out the ministry that Christ gave to them before he ascended into heaven. So must we, 
so must we. So many of the problems in uh, modern evangelicalism and some of the problems we are experiencing in our own denomination could be solved if we would just go back to the Bible and look at the model of the apostles, look at the model of the Apostle Paul and how he ministered as a pastor and as a missionary. It's so clear here in Acts chapter 20. Dear ones, Paul's ministry is recorded by Luke to instruct, challenge, and motivate us in our 21st century PCA context. Moreover, it highlights two vital characteristics that I would argue are desperately needed today in our sanctuaries, studies, session rooms, church courts, homes, neighborhoods, and various fields of mission. And what are those two characteristics? Holy courage and gospel confidence. Holy courage and gospel confidence. If you don't remember much about what I'm going to say over the next few minutes, remember this. Pray for holy courage and pray for confidence in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without these two characteristics, holy courage and gospel confidence, the strong and deadly undercurrents of our secular culture will slowly, subtly, and inevitably pull us out into the perilous waters of cultural accommodation. Without holy courage and gospel confidence in our ministries, we will drift away from biblical fidelity and confessional integrity in the Presbyterian Church in America. And as I unpack some of these truths here in this text, we're not going to obviously deal with all of it. Uh, in the course of my ministry, I'd probably take four or five sermons uh, on this section. Uh, but tonight, we're going to look at some of the, the highlights uh, and also think specifically about the Presbyterian Church in America. Without these two characteristics, holy courage and gospel confidence, we will come to embrace the new progressive Christianity, one that makes deals with the culture to stay relevant in the eyes of the world. It's a slow death march to liberalism. Those who are students of Presbyterian history know what I am talking about, and it grieves me to say that just last week, the Church of Scotland voted to affirm the ordinations of practicing homosexuals. How can it be? Well, Dr. Hamilton's gonna help us to, to understand that historically and perhaps theologically uh, tomorrow as he gives us a lecture on the Church of Scotland from 1560 to the present. But how grievous that they have made this decision. Could anyone could ever have imagined even 50, 60 years ago, something like this. Certainly John Knox would be rolling over in his grave. And please hear me on this. Please hear me on this. We are all susceptible to this drift. Some are susceptible to drifting to the far aggressive right. Some are susceptible to sliding to the progressive left. Everyone is susceptible to drift. All of us, no matter what tribe we may find ourselves in at this time. Which is why God's word is full of exhortations and warnings to stand firm. To stay alert. To preach the word. To fulfill your ministry. To humble yourself. To be vigilant and to not shrink back. Do not shrink back. Back. It's a, a wonderful, uh, there's wonderful imagery there of, of, a, of a, a person shrinking back, a minister shrinking back from carrying out their calling to preach the word and to shepherd the flock of God and to protect the flock of God. God knows that it's not only the sheep who need to be encouraged, to be encouraged, but also the shepherds. And so he gives us examples like Paul to to strengthen our hearts and our hands in ministry. It's why he gives us examples like Daniel and his three friends who were unwilling to bow the knee to the secular idols of their age, even at the risk of their very own lives. And so let's think for a few minutes about holy courage. As we turn to our text this evening, we see 
The Apostle Paul is in Miletus, a town about 30 miles from Ephesus, as he makes his way to Jerusalem. Paul is eager to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost, but first he wants to speak to the Ephesian elders one last time. He wants to encourage them. He loved them. He loved the elders. He wanted to encourage them. And so he sends for them through an emissary, and the Ephesian elders, or presbyteroi, agree to meet Paul in Miletus. His address to the elders is a brief but powerful synopsis of his ministry while in Ephesus for three years. Again, it's a summary of what faithful ministry ought to look like in principle for all pastors and all elders in all times and in all places and in all cultures. So how does Paul model holy courage? I want to give three um, ways that he models holy courage, and there are many, many more, uh, but for the sake of time, we'll focus on three, and this first one is the one I'll focus on the most. Number one, Paul models holy courage by boldly preaching against the false gods and destructive ideologies of his first century Greco-Roman culture, outside and inside the church. Paul models holy courage by boldly preaching against the false gods and destructive ideologies of his first century Greco-Roman culture outside and inside the church. Let's get some context here. Look with me at Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 23, as it gives, again, some context for the encouragement he gives in Acts 20. Acts 19, 23, about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into dis disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Paul's preaching was courageous. Paul's preaching was courageous. How? It boldly confronts that which is highly valued, celebrated, and worshipped by the culture. It boldly confronts that which is highly valued, celebrated, and worshipped by the culture. He does not stay silent about culturally acceptable idolatries, even at the risk of his own comfort and safety and personal relationships. He does not shrink back from preaching whatever will be beneficial to his hearers. The love of Christ compelled him to confront and expose that which poisons the souls of lost men and women and boys and girls, even though it will anger many in the community and have a direct impact on local businesses, on the economy, and on family incomes. And by boldly confronting the popular sins of Greco-Roman society, Paul was no first century culture warrior or social justice warrior placing focus on societal moral reform over and or against the salvation of souls and the planting of churches and the growing of mature disciples. Oh no, Paul was a gospel preacher. He was set apart for the gospel of God to lead lost sinners to Jesus. And if if ever ministers needed to model themselves after this kind of a man, it is now. We need to model, we need to see him as a model for our ministries. Paul was set apart for the gospel of God to lead lost sinners to Jesus. The apostle was contra mundum pro mundo. That is, he was against the world and all of its lies and ideologies for the world. He was against the world for the world, teaching and warning people to turn from idolatry and deceptive ideologies to serve the living and the true God. He preached the law and the gospel 
a law that exposes and condemns sin, and a gospel that reveals Christ's saving righteousness. And he preached to everyone, verse 21, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's precisely because Paul loved the lost that he exposed the lies that enslaved them. It's precisely because he had biblical compassion for the lost that he proclaimed the unvarnished truth of the gospel. We do no favors to our unbelieving friends when we water things down and we hold things back and we don't tell them the truth. And beloved, it's vital for us to understand this evening that Paul's courageous preaching in Ephesus against the darling idols of the culture was carried out both outside the church evangelistically and inside the church pastorally. It happens in both places. In his three-year ministry in Ephesus, Paul preached in the local synagogue for three months. What did he preach? The law and the gospel. How did Paul preach? Luke records in Acts 19.8 that he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. His hearers didn't like it. They rejected Paul. They rejected his message, not because he displayed a lack of sensitivity or because he didn't understand the demographics of his ministry context. No, Luke records that it was because his hearers were, quote, stubborn and continued in unbelief and spoke evil of the gospel. That's how their response is described. And sadly, this is sometimes how people respond to faithful biblical preaching. And of course, Paul didn't adjust his message to be more culturally acceptable, to make things more palatable to his audiences. He had those who were his countrymen in front of him who he was trying to reach. He had Greeks in front of him who he's trying to reach. And he did not change his message in order to make it more culturally acceptable. He preached against the idols of the culture because he loved them and he wanted them to see the error and falsehood of their ways and to come to see the beauty and the loveliness of the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul moved on after those three months to what was known as the Hall of Tyrannus, a kind of public lecture hall in town. And there he preached, quote, the word of the Lord. He didn't preach himself. He didn't preach sociology. He, he didn't tell stories. Well, he probably told some stories, but it would have been illustrating what he was saying. He preached the word of the Lord. He did so daily for two full years. It was Paul's bold preaching. We can hardly get people to have an evening worship service. He's preaching every day. And people are coming. They're, they're coming to hear the word of the Lord. And it was Paul's bold preaching that led Demetrius, the silversmith, to start the riot that was caused in Acts 19. But Paul's courageous preaching that exposed cultural lies were not limited to his evangelistic work. This was also a part of his ministry within the church. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul exhorts God's people to, quote, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition according to the elemental principles of this world and not according to Christ. Another translation puts it this way, see to it that no one captivate you with an empty, seductive philosophy. Still another, which is really a paraphrase, says it this way, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. High-sounding nonsense. That is that which sounds so enlightened so sophisticated to the unbelieving culture, but is really a load of nonsense when held up to the truth of Scripture and reason. When we read our New Testaments, we learn that the apostles preached and taught against a lot of high-sounding nonsense, such as, for instance, Gnosticism, the worship of angels, antinomianism, legalism, all kinds of other syncretistic philosophies that emerged in the early church. And dear ones, whatever side you might find yourself on in the PCA, surely we can all be in agreement that we must as churches and as presbyteries and as a denomination stand firm against that which undermines the truth 
and sufficiency of the gospel in our secular age, outside and inside our churches. The Apostle Paul and the other apostles model this for us, and we must follow their example. Paul's warning in Colossians 2.8 is related to any philosophical teaching or high-minded nonsense or ideology, whether Jewish or Greek or ancient or modern, that is, not according to Christ and thus in some way negotiates the gospel. Myths, human traditions, seductive philosophies, and subversive cultural movements are indeed what Satan employs to enslave unbelievers and to seduce Christians and churches away from Christ and his gospel. It's what the evil one uses to unsettle and divide denominations. We see it happening all around us, and we see it happening even within our own beloved church, the Presbyterian Church in America. In our own day, there are two deceptive and destructive ideologies that have infiltrated virtually every level of society, from the White House to the schoolhouse, from the corporate boardroom to the locker room, from stadiums to sanctuaries. And what are these two ideologies, do I even need to say? They are that which really define the moral revolution. These are the ideologies rooted in the LGBTQ plus revolution and the social justice CRT, or as some say for shorthand, the woke revolution. It is a religion. We talked about being born again this morning. There is that language that's incorporated into this new CRT ideology. You, you, you become alive and aware of all that, that now you must learn from them in order to be right with the world. Sadly, aspects of these ideologies have even gotten a foothold in the PCA. And dear ones, it brings me no pleasure to say that. No pleasure. I have never woken up for one morning of my life and thought, you know, I want to have a difficult conversation today with one of my PCA brothers. Not one morning have I woken up and thought, you know, I want to have some contention today as it concerns the PCA. It brings me no pleasure to say that these things have gotten a foothold in our denomination. It grieves me. And I wouldn't have had to say this 10 years ago. But we've moved from a kind of broadness that where we could have friendly disagreements about things and, and have conversations and be on different pages on certain things, but we could move along as a denomination. But that broadness has moved to a, a progressiveness and some quarters of our church, and it's causing division. Well, how has LGBTQ plus ideology gotten a foothold in the PCA? Well, primarily through Revoice, a conference hosted and promoted by one of our own churches in St. Louis in 2018. This conference exists to promote a version of side B gay Christianity. And I say a version because a lot of people talk about various versions of side B. Well, the version that Revoice is putting forth is one that emphasizes, now please hear this, immutable homosexual desires and celibacy over progressive sanctification and chastity. It's a version of side B gay Christianity that emphasizes immutable homosexual desires and celibacy over progressive sanctification and chastity. Side B places an emphasis on care over cure, on compassion over conformity to Jesus that we heard so much about in at least two of the messages today. In other words, according to many in the Revoice movement, if a true believer struggles with same-sex attraction, and some most certainly do, they should not expect those attractions and desires to ever really change, at least not much. And nor should the church. They state that for those believers struggling with homosexual desires, the church should focus merely on ministering to them without a view to any significant change. In fact, some infer that it's cruel 
to do otherwise. In a recent podcast, Christian author and former lesbian professor of feminist studies, Rosaria Butterfield, lamented that the side B gay movement puts gay desires in some kind of a protected sin category. A protected sin category. But dear ones, unnatural sexual desires are not a protected sin. As we heard earlier, there are no protected sins. No, it's a sin, like all sins, that must be repented of and mortified with a view to the weakening of that sin over time by the power of the Holy Spirit in union with the living Christ. Our own confession on the chapter dealing with sanctification, chapter 13, states that, quote, the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they more and more, and they are more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The unbiblical notions of side B gay Christianity are set forth in a popular new book written by one of our own PCA ministers, a book entitled Still Time to Care, and it's received attention all over the world. It's being lauded as the book for the side B gay movement. In a recent book review co-written by two Covenant College professors, they point out that Still Time to Care does a fine job in some areas. And yet they rightfully raise concern over the fact that the book is full of statements that call into question that any real substantive change can take place in a believer who struggles with same-sex attraction. One example is on page 138 where the author writes, quote, it would be naive to think that something so deeply rooted as the inward pull of sexual temptation could be eliminated in this life, end quote. Now, it's true that these sexual temptations will not always be eliminated in a believer in this life. But what is not clearly emphasized is that these unnatural sexual temptations can, over time, greatly weaken, and in some cases, weaken to the point of hardly experiencing them at all. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit working through the diligent use of the means of grace over time. Through the daily spirit-empowered mortification of remaining and dwelling sin. By wise separation from the gay culture that will feed those desires. And finally, I might add, by humbly pursuing God's will and design for marriage and family. In my ministry, as I've had an opportunity to minister to those who are, have had uh, a past of struggling with homosexuality or have engaged in homosexual activity and are now married with children, have expressed to me how sanctifying it is to do God's design and will for marriage. You see, it's pursuing Christ, by his grace and by his spirit in the ordinary means of grace, it's sitting under the faithful preaching of the word week after week. It's coming to the Lord's table. It's remembering our baptism. It's believing that God will work through the means that he has promised to bless in the lives of his elect. And it's separating ourselves from a culture which is debased and which feeds these desires, which even expresses itself in extraordinary effeminacy. These things should not be. And Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction should flee this kind of culture. Rather than pursue celibacy, which is native to Roman Catholicism, Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction should pursue chastity and biblical marriage. Beloved, the problem with a focus on care over cure is that it advocates for a kind of settled gay Christian identity in the church, an approach which leaves the believer who struggles with same-sex attraction without hope for change, without the joyful anticipation of experiencing less of these unnatural and sinful desires in the future and growing more and more in conformity 
to the holiness of Jesus. And we're talking about a sin that is being talked about all the time and everywhere, it seems. And it's not just this sin that weakens over time. It's other sins. We could, we could name 50 of them in our lives that, that we can have hope that over time, through the diligent use of the means of grace and sitting under the word and, and drinking deeply of the means of grace over time, being led out into the verdant pastures and feasting and being led by the still water so that, 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 that Christ feeds our souls. And this is happening week after week, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, month after month, year after year. Whatever sin you're struggling with, over time, those sins will weaken and you will grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and in conformity to his word. So we're, we're not simply thinking here of just this one sin is the only thing we need to think about in these terms. It's all sin. It's just that nobody has created an entire ministry that has the moniker before Christian like gay Christian for their particular sin. That's why things are so unsettled right now. It goes without saying. Many who are experiencing homosexual desires or gender dysphoria have been entangled in the web of homosexual pornography or ungodly relationships or sinful patterns of thinking and living, sometimes for years, sometimes looking at tens of thousands, perhaps more, images and videos that, that we've learned through uh, science has, can even sort of reformat your brain when you're looking at that kind of stuff so much. It's why people, when they get hooked on pornography, uh, then uh, heterosexual pornography is not enough and they begin exploring homosexual pornography and that's not enough and, and they need a greater hit. And so uh, like they're on crack cocaine, they need a greater hit. And so they start looking at child pornography and it goes down this black hole. And this kind of stuff twists the mind and, and someone can obviously come to know the Lord and be born again and be brought out of this. But it takes time and separation from those wicked things and under the means of grace to grow and to be sanctified. And so there is hope if you are struggling with same-sex attraction and listening to the voices of side B, I encourage you tonight to stop listening to revoice and to start listening to God's voice. I hope you understand that nobody on the GRN Council my guess is just about nobody in this room is angry or upset at anyone struggling with same-sex attraction. If you're watching tonight, just know this, we love you and we are preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because we love you. And we know there is hope in the gospel. What we are called to offer our friends in the culture, our friends in the church who are struggling with same-sex attraction is not some halfway house of redemption that is forgiven but still under the dominion and power of sin. No, the gospel announces to us the good news that through faith in Christ, we are set free from the dominion and power of sin and death in Adam. United to Christ, we are liberated to walk in the newness of resurrection life. In Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. In Christ, we have died to sin and we no longer live in it. Sin is no longer our master. This, of course, includes concupiscence at the level of sexual desire. The Holy Spirit, as we heard earlier, sanctifies every part of us that was formerly depraved including our desires, including the inward pull of unnatural sexual temptation and attraction in those who possess those desires. In Romans 6, Paul responds to those who think that because of God's abounding grace and justification, it might be acceptable to continue in sin that grace may abound. That God is happy when we sin because then he gets to pour out more grace and we get to experience more grace. So let's revel in our brokenness. Oh no, may it never be, Paul says. How can we 
who died to sin still live in it, for sin will have no dominion over you. John Murray explains it well, quote, what the apostle has in view is the once for all definitive breach with sin which constitutes the identity of the believer. A believer cannot therefore live in sin. If a man lives in sin, he is not a believer. If we view sin as a realm or sphere, he writes, then the believer no longer lives in that realm or sphere, end quote. Dear ones, the breach with sin does not mean that we are without the presence of remaining sin, but that remaining sin does not enslave us. It's no longer master over us, and we have been empowered by the Spirit to mortify it. And over time, it weakens, and we become more like Christ. Again, we are freed from the dominion of sin, but not its presence. I love what Thomas Watson says in The Godly Man's Picture, quote, Though sin lives in him, he does not live in sin. The important point here is that side B gay Christianity actually undermines the gospel. It subverts the doctrine of union with Christ and extinguishes hope and expectation for progressive sanctification. It leaves a person struggling with same-sex attraction without hope. But we are here to say tonight that there is hope in the gospel for change. And it's not going to happen overnight. We live in a microwave society. Do you remember trying to get on the internet 15 years ago? It it, it took like two minutes, which two seconds is an eternity now to get online. We live in a society, we want things immediately. Why aren't you taking these desires away, Lord? It's been three months. Wait a minute, have you not been looking at homosexual porn for five years? Maybe that's not the case, maybe it is, maybe it's longer. Whatever the case may be, with these desires, we must recognize that it takes time to mortify them, to be under the ministry of the word, and not just that sin, but other sins as well. It doesn't happen overnight, which our confession makes clear as well in chapter 13 of the, of the confession. I'm concerned that many have focused more on the psychological and cultural dynamics of this issue as the world does and not the theological and confessional. We must ask ourselves, we must ask ourselves as a denomination, do we believe the word of God on this issue? Do we believe in the gospel, that gospel that causes us by the power of the Holy Spirit to be born again unto a living hope and brings us into union with Christ, removes us from that tree of Adam, as Thomas Boston says in his human nature and in its fourfold state, and and breaks us off. We are a a, a dead and putrefying branch on the, the tree of Adam, and he breaks us off, and he unites us to Christ, the living vine, and then we begin to bear fruit, and that vine is growing and changing and transforming and becoming more like the vine. Do we believe that happens? Do we believe the word of God? Let me encourage you, if you have not thought deeply about the theology of the side B gay Christian movement, I encourage you to. You've, we've touched upon it tonight, but, but listen, as far as the slippery slope goes, if side B continues to have a place in the PCA, it will eventually turn to side A. Eventually. It may take 10 years. It may take 20 years, but it will come. And it came last week for the Church of Scotland. Beloved, a compromise on side B is deferred, a deferred decision to embrace a position of total affirmation of homosexuality, a side A position which we've seen accepted by many. Well, dear ones, another secular ideology that has gotten a foothold in our denomination is social justice and CRT. We certainly don't have time to unpack the complexities of this revolutionary ideology and secular movement. 
But to give it a little definition uh, uh, to the modern, to give a little definition to this movement, this social justice CRT movement, uh, which is heavily informed, of course, by this critical race theory, uh, one university defines it like this, quote, CRT recognizes that racism is ingrained in the fabric of American society. And institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture. CRT identifies that existing power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. And it rejects meritocracy as a vehicle for self-interest, power, and privilege." End quote. Now let me say from the outset, before I begin to look at this for a few moments, racism is a wicked sin. Where it is found in our hearts or in our churches, it must be repented of. But this woke movement is a false, secular religion founded upon a false, secular ideology. It should be rejected in our society, and of course, it should never be allowed to find a home in our churches. But sadly, it has. And again, it brings me no pleasure to say so. Part of what we want to do as an organization is to help people to understand what's happening in our denomination. That elders would, would sit up straight and, and think, wow, this is, this is happening in our churches. I did, not, I did not know that. I would like to know more. I'd like, I'd like to get involved. I'd like to start going to presbytery. I'd like to start coming to the General Assembly. And some of these elders may even be in churches where these things are happening and aren't and are feeling unsettled about it, but there's no one to talk to. And so we bring up these things tonight. I bring up these things and it brings me no pleasure. And I've heard many PCA church members and session members, I've heard from many of them around the country over the last couple of years who have witnessed this ideology in their pulpits and in their church's ministry or, or a neighboring ministry. Last fall, an influential PCA pastor used a responsive corporate confession of sin written by an individual with obvious alignments to the woke and LGBTQ plus movement. May I read you some of this confession of sin that was prayed in a PCA church this fall and I believe is a favorite among wokish churches. The pastor begins, remember, Lord, what happened to the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, what is also called North America, when the Europeans arrived on our shores. The congregation responds, look and see the disgraceful way we have treated those created in your image. Pastor, our ancestors sinned the great sin of greed, theft, and genocide. Congregation, our ancestors are no more, but we bear their shame. Pastor, our own myths of peace and exceptionalism have been exposed. Congregation, woe to us, for we have sinned. Pastor, our hearts are faint and our eyes grow dim. Congregation, for we have appropriated, looked away, and attempted to silence native cultures. Pastor, we have not treated your natural creation with love and care as commanded in your word. We have not been the stewards you call us to be. Congregation, the land lies desolate, far from the shalom and harmony found in the garden. It continues to be harmed by pollution and resource exploitation. That's as far as I'll read. Beloved, is this really the way forward for the PCA? Is this the future of the PCA? Should we be concerned that this woke ideology is in the liturgies of our churches and set forth in our pulpits. Dear ones, the infiltration of this ideology in the PCA is not just simply found in a few isolated instances. A published statement for a developing PCA church in the Midwest states the following that will shape their values as a church. Quote, this is the first one under what will shape their values? Black dignity. Quote, we value the imago dei in black bodies. We will center the God-given dignity found in the experience and culture of the diverse black communities found in our region. We will be a congregation that will be unashamedly Christian and unapologetically African-American centered. Can you imagine if those 
were reversed. We value the Imago Dei in white bodies. We will be a congregation that will be unashamedly Christian and unapologetically white-centered. It sounds so ridiculous. Both of those sound so ridiculous. And of course, we know that there are going to be particular ministries focused on particular areas. And we, we appreciate that. We appreciate the challenges of that and wanting to identify with the community. But to be so specific about ethnicity in these ways, it's concerning. They also say they want to be kingdom focused. We will focus on pursuing Christ's shalom in the community in which God plants our church. We will cooperate with community partners to do spirit-empowered deeds of justice, mercy, love, and development in our home community. It doesn't need to be said that the mission of the church is not community development. Several books are recommended. One is A Black Theology of Liberation by James Cone. Another is called, now listen, Burn It All Down, Refusing to Reconcile with Compromise by Robert Callahan. You can look up these books for yourself and see they are on the far, far radical side of the woke agenda. Now again, I must ask, is this the future of the PCA? The secular ideology is also evidenced in a required world mission class offered at our own Covenant Theological Seminary. In a strange class activity called a privilege walk, the seminary students follow statements that are read by the facilitator, and the participants are asked to take a step forward or backward based on their responses. This activity forces participants to confront ways quote, in which society privileges some individual over others. There are 44 questions and answers related to privilege. I'm going to read just eight of them. Number one, if your, ans if your ancestors were forced to come to the USA, not by choice, take one step back. If your primary ethnic identity is American, take one step forward. If you were ever called names because of your race, class, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back. If you were ever discouraged from academics or jobs because of race, class, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back. If you were encouraged to attend college by your parents, take one step forward. If you were ever offered a good job because of your association with a friend or a family member, take one step forward. If you were ever denied employment because of your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back, and on and on. Now, I've seen these kinds of things done over the years in mainline churches and seminaries but I've never seen them in the PC. I have never seen them in any of the seminaries I've studied in or taught in. The kind of exercise plays into the woke narrative. It ignores important biblical conversations about providence and giving thanks in all circumstances and understanding these things from a scriptural point of view and, and should have no place in our denominational seminary. Is this the kind of thing that we find acceptable in the PCA? Should we all be doing that privilege walk in our churches? Is this what the model is for our future ministers? The last thing I'd like to share is a story. It's close to home. It's in a friend of mine's church. After the George Floyd incident, he began preaching boldly and rightly that the church will not change its message in light of this terrible incident. We will continue, he said, to preach Christ and him crucified. Because Christ and the gospel, he said, are what everyone needs. Not Black Lives Matter, not CRT, not these cultural ideologies which promise so much but give so little. The gospel will remain central, he said. And one of his elders was enraged and said to him verbatim, one of his elders now, was enraged and said to him verbatim, this is no time for the gospel. But dear ones, the problem right now is, is not that so many people are saying things like that, but they're, they're feeling them, they're sensing them. Maybe it's, maybe it's not time for the old paths of gospel ministry. Maybe it's time for something else. I mean, look at the wave of the culture that's coming to us. We're going to become irrelevant. No one's going to listen to us anymore if we keep going down the path. 
the old paths pioneered by Christ and the apostles. This is no time for the gospel. Oh, yes, it is. It's always time for the gospel. Whoever says they don't believe it or will bring persecution or whatever may come, it's always time for the gospel. Ask, ask Daniel and his three friends if it was time for the gospel in their age. Ask Paul if it was time for the gospel when the, the Jews were persecuting him and, and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Greco-Roman authorities wanted to kill him. Was it time for the gospel? Yes, it was time for the gospel. Another one of his elders, it just goes on, the story goes on, I'm afraid to say. Another one of his elders said that the gospel didn't work for social situations like this, and he began marching in Black Lives Matter protests. Neither elder stayed in the church. My pastor friend didn't see this coming. Other churches are experiencing these kinds of challenges. I've heard from them. Brothers and sisters, I could share many other instances of the infiltration of woke ideology in the PCA, and I only share these few because I want us to see the problem and share concern about the problem. I want to open my arms wide to those who may be on what some will call the other side of these issues and to say, is this the future of the PCA in your mind? Is this your vision for the PCA? Or is this a, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that, but I'm not quite sure I want to speak against it. Because that kind of attitude is not gospel courage. And we must put Christ over relationships and friendships if it means those break rather than our denomination break. Shouldn't we share concern about this problem? Again, it brings me no pleasure to bring these things up. Dear brothers and sisters, I share these things not to bring division, but because there already is division. There already is division in the PCA. And the division has been caused by those who are incorporating these secular ideologies into their worship, ministry, and mission. I share these things because I, I believe with all of my heart that we are at a serious crossroads in the PCA contending for the very soul of the Presbyterian Church in America. And this is not an exaggeration. Which way will the PCA go? If these ideologies that have taken root in the PCA continue to grow and spread, if they take up long-term residence, the PCA will look like a liberal denomination in 15 to 20 years. But if preachers exercise holy courage and preach and teach against these secular ideologies, wisely, by the way, don't make it like your, your sermon series for two years. Be wise about it. Write pastoral letters about it carefully, skillfully, lovingly, humbly, Teach a Sunday school lesson on it or several. Preach a sermon series on it that's uh, 10 or 12 uh, uh, sermons like Pastor Harry Reeder did so wonderfully and skillfully. But if preachers do not do this, we will continue down the wrong road. We need to root these ideologies out of our churches, out of our presbyteries, out of our institutions, and instead preach a sufficient and powerful gospel from the whole counsel of God. That's the full-time job. And the word of God does not return void, but accomplishes that for which God will send it forth, to judge some and to save others. And if we do this, dear ones, and I, I welcome the national partnership and, and all of those who may be wondering if this is uh, the right way or the, the right kind of movement or whatever, I invite you to join with us as brothers to see widespread reformation and revival and unity in the truth in the PCA as we go forward in the future. That is possible, but it is not possible if we continue to hold on to these wicked secular ideologies which are confusing the lost and confounding the saved in our own churches. We could indeed move forward with peace and purity, but this will only come with spirit-wrought humility. And that's the second thing that Paul models with holy courage. 
being clothed, holy courage is being clothed with humility and tears. It takes courage to keep offering your heart to others, brothers, especially after it's been stomped on a few times. One of the biggest struggles I've seen in fellow ministers and even have had to fight against in my own heart is, is having cynicism in ministry. You've been hurt so many times. You've struggled so many times. You, you've stopped. Your eyes are no longer wet with tears. They're, they're dry like a desert. And you, your heart has become hardened with pride. So rather than humility and tears, you have pride and dry eyes. It's a temptation for all of us. Not with Paul. Paul's been through many difficulties, difficulties, but he continues to give his heart to God and to others. In his testimony to the elders in Acts 20, he states in verses 18 and 19, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials and that happened to me through the plotting of the Jews. And down in verse 31, he states, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish or warn everyone with tears. One might assume that Paul's boldness and courage to preach against highly prized cultural idols and worldly ideologies meant that he was on the severe and unfeeling side of humanity, that he was a, a first century TR. Always combative and, and unemotional. I don't want to be around people like that. I'd rather be around a flaming charismatic than a, a mean TR. Amen? I run from people like that. Paul wasn't a TR. He was full of tears and humility. Paul was a man who served the Lord with humility and tears. He strongly believed and deeply felt the truth that he proclaimed. He was an experiential Christian. A man of true piety. He loved God and he loved people, not just with his mind and will, but with his heart and affections, and so must we. Where we have failed to do this, let us repent. Where I have failed to do this, may I repent. Even as we contend for the truth, let us do so with humility and tears. Paul is a model in this. And did you notice in verse 31 the reason why Paul wept? He wept as he admonished them about some from among them, from among the elders that would arise and speak twisted things to draw away the disciples. Not if, but when this happens, he exhorts them to stand firm in the Lord and in his truth. Thirdly, Paul models holy courage and pastoral ministry in his leadership to the elders. Paul sent for the elders. He wanted to encourage the elders, to teach them, to admonish them, to exhort them one last time. He did not just labor alongside the elders. He took time to encourage them and to teach them. And teaching elders, we need to do the same. Encourage your session by spending time with them, by giving them good books to read, by keeping them informed and updated and exhorting them to, to piety, true piety in the home and, and on the Sabbath day. But finally and briefly, it's not only holy courage we need, we need gospel confidence. Not confidence in ourselves, our programs, our resources, our plan to be culturally relevant, our, our institutions, our denomination, our, our politics. And by the way, may our commitment to an institution never be beyond our commitment to Christ. Whether it's the PCA or whatever it is. Christ is our king, we serve him ultimately. Our confidence must be in the gospel. The gospel is not only true, but it is sufficient. I believe along with courage to stand firm for the gospel, we need to be confident in the gospel and the gospel means that he has given to us for its propagation and for discipleship. The reformed have always held to the centrality of the means of grace because we've always believed in the centrality of the gospel in worship discipleship and mission. And when we keep the means of grace central, the gospel stays central. Christ stays central. And God rests upon the church with weightiness. The Apostle Paul did not shrink back from preaching the whole counsel of God, whatever would be of benefit to them. And of course, that preaching centered on the gospel. 
Not a moralistic gospel focused on our good works or on social action, but a gospel rooted in the supernatural saving power of God in Christ. Have you noticed how supernaturalism is lost on the far right and on the far left? You can do it without God. And everybody's mad. But true supernaturalism is humble and it preaches Christ. It boasts in the Lord. Paul's confidence was not a misplaced confidence. His confidence was in the message and means of the gospel. Why? Because it's where God's saving power is. Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul writes, and remember, remember the culture that Paul is ministering in? It's way worse than ours. Way worse. And what does he say? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God. The gospel is the saving, operative power of God unto salvation to those who believe, both Jew and Greek. For in it, the righteousness, the saving righteousness of God is revealed. This is dynamite. This is quite fitting, this word dunamis. Because when the gospel is faithfully preached, when the person and redemptive work of Christ is heralded, the power of God is unleashed through the gospel and new life erupts from the grave of spiritual death and new affections spring forth and a new heart and a new perspective emerge and the old life in Adam is replaced with new life in Jesus Christ. This is all the result of the almighty power of God working through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Cranfield says, quote, the reason why Paul is not overcome by the temptation to be ashamed of the gospel, but on the contrary, exults in it and lives to proclaim it, is that he knows that this apparently weak and foolish message is really, in spite of all appearances, power. And not just one power over and against others, but the supreme power, the almighty power of God himself directed toward the salvation of men, God's almighty saving power, end quote. This is so important for our gospel witness. Where does our confidence lie? Is it misplaced on something else or is it in the power of the gospel preached? That is where We will see reformation and revival in the PCA and in our society. It's through God-centered, Christ-centered preaching because that's where the operative power of God lies to save sinners, to unite spiritually dead and depraved sinners to the resurrected and living Christ. As one writer states that, quote, the phrase formulates the dynamic character of God's gospel. The word may announce the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the emphasis is on that word as a force or power unleashed in human history. That is what we are called to do, dear pastors, to preach the power of God in the gospel unleashed in human history, in our time, in our age, in our secular, post-Christian age in America. And may we do it, because it's a divine power, it's an effective power, it's a life-transforming power, and the gospel is the person and saving work of Jesus Christ. And so, holy courage and gospel confidence. It's a way forward for the PCA. How do we show this? Number one, by a sincere commitment to the authority and sufficiency of the Bible. This means rejecting secular ideologies and instead embracing biblical sexuality and biblical justice. It means being committed to biblical preaching. Number two, a sincere commitment to our reformed confessional standards and a rejection of the growing latitudinarianism that we see happening in our presbyteries. Number three, a sincere commitment to reform worship, especially as it relates to the regulative principle and our ministers leading the worship services. A sincere commitment to reformed mission, carrying out the great commission 
to send ordained men onto the mission field to plant and strengthen churches for the glory of God. A sincere commitment to church discipline in the courts of the church. And sixthly, a sincere commitment to godly piety, personal piety, family piety, corporate piety, pastoral piety. Dear ones, these are the old paths of Christian ministry that must be recovered if we are going to see health in the PCA. They must never be surrendered. These are the priorities of the apostles and of our Lord himself. And by God's grace, we need holy courage and gospel confidence, the kind that Paul possessed. Pastoral cowardice is the water that advances the erosion of orthodoxy. Pastoral cowardice and misplaced confidence inevitably lead to compromise in ministry. So Paul is an amazing example. He's an object of sovereign grace, and that grace compelled him to be courageous and confident in the gospel itself. And he writes in chapter 20, verse 24, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And Father, while we have heard some challenging things tonight, and as I sit under even my own preaching and I'm convicted of your word in many ways, Lord, none of us are without sin. And so we ask for your grace. We ask for your grace to have holy courage and gospel confidence for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.